Good morning. Because we were not able to worship due to the weather on Wednesday, we moved Ash Wednesday to today. Yes, there was one service today. So technically, we are kind of celebrating Ash Wednesday, recognizing Ash Wednesday today on this Sunday. And so that being said, we will use the bulletins, the bulletin that we will use this Lenten season. Uh, Just a reminder, we return these at the end of the service so we can make use of them on Wednesdays. Uh, This year, our theme is following Jesus' final steps, the final steps up to his crucifixion, his death, his suffering for us. On the cross, and we're going to take a look at those final steps that led up to a tomb today, in particular. So, I invite you to turn then in your service folder to the opening sentences. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. And we begin with our opening hymn, hymn 848. Again, those hymns are found on the back cover of your service folder. Please stand. Again, we turn back to our service folder. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, We have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. You may be seated. The first of our three readings for this, again, the Ash Wednesday recognition, is from Isaiah. First of our readings is from Isaiah 59, verses 12 through 20. 
Yes, our rebellious deeds are many before you, and our sins testify against us. Our rebellious deeds are with us, and as for our guilty deeds, we are aware of them. Those deeds are rebellion and treachery against the Lord. We turn back from following our God. We incite oppression and apostasy. We conceive and mutter deceitful words from our hearts. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth stumbles in the city square and honesty cannot enter it. The truth is missing and anyone who turns from evil makes himself pray. P-R-E-Y. The Lord looked and saw something evil. There was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one who could intervene. And so his own arm worked salvation for him and for his own righteousness supported him. He clothed himself with righteousness like armor and wore a helmet of salvation on his head. He dressed in garments for vengeance and he wrapped himself with zeal like a cloak. He will repay in full what they have earned, namely wrath to his foes and full payment to his enemies. He will repay even the distant coastlands. From the west, they will fear the Lord's name, and from the rising of the sun, they will fear his glory. For he will, be co- he will come like a raging river, driven by the Spirit of the Lord. Then a Redeemer will come for Zion, and for those in Jacob who turn from their rebellion. This is the declaration of the Lord. This is the word of our God. We join then in singing together with the choir Psalm 51 in the front of the hymnal. Our second lesson speaks of that one who comes, who 
does what we could not do and undoes what we did in sin. From 2 Corinthians chapter 5 into chapter 6, verse 2. We urge you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, at a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. See, now is the day of salvation. This is the word of our God. Our choir will respond with him 525. And for our gospel lesson, this morning we read from Luke's gospel, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus told this parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we join in our next posted hymn, 488. Please note we will sing verses 1 four, and five.
in the name of Jesus, whose way, whose life, and whose death redeems us in more ways than we can ask or imagine, and whose death and resurrection to life brings us hope and comfort in this life and in death. In looking at Jesus' final steps to the tomb this morning, we're going to focus our attention on much of John's 11th chapter, and I'll, rather than read it all now, I will read it as we go through it this morning. As we focus on Jesus' final steps to that tomb, namely the tomb of Lazarus, I ask you a question. Would you want to know how and when and where you're going to die? I let you think about that for a little bit because it's not really an easy answer. Most of the time, we think about that pretty quickly and say, no, I don't want to know. Why not? I think, wouldn't it be kind of nice to know where and how and when you die? Because then, well, you can go and check off that bucket list. You can get everything done, as the Corinthians did. Eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow, or whenever, we die. YOLO, they say, right? You only live once. Some live that way. Or maybe, if you did know how and when and where you're going to die, would you be afraid? Would your life just be absolutely miserable because you know, okay, on this day, in This time and this way, this is how I'm going to go from this life. I know without a doubt that every one of us gathered in this room would be afraid. Because that's what death does. You want to know how I know that? One word. COVID. Why is it that we were so afraid when somebody told us you could get sick and you could die? Let's not get together. Let's not be around each other. Let's mask up. Let's get injected with whatever it is to protect ourselves and let's trust in the science. I know it makes you feel uncomfortable, doesn't it? But it's all about fear, isn't it? And it's about fearing one thing, death. Everybody in this room is going to die. Sorry, it's the truth. (laughs) But what if you did know how and when and where? You know what Martin Luther said? He said, if the world goes to pieces, I'm going to still go and plant my apple tree. What do you mean by that? I'm still going to live the life that God has given to me here, or as we sang in the hymn, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But let's face it, we don't know when we're going to die. Which makes it all the more amazing when Jesus takes his final steps. Because he did. He didn't know the how, the where, and the when. He knew all of the details. Every whip, lash on his back, every drop of spittle that was thrown and hurled his way, every blow from whatever staff or fist, every hair that was plucked out of his beard, Every word that was spoken against him in mockery and derision, he would hear it all resounding through his head. All the denials, 
the betrayals, the secret meetings at night from those who were supposed to be leading people to see who Jesus is as the Messiah, and instead they were leading him away? What would you and I do if we knew that? We'd be afraid. I already proved that point. But not Jesus. Jesus set his face like flint to go about his father's plan to take those final steps in the necessary way that his father would have all set out for him to give God the glory and ultimately to show his unconditional dying love for you and me. And that's why when we take these final steps with our Lord Jesus today to that tomb, we see him do this absolutely unbelievable miracle. And it's unbelievable sometimes, I think, because we've never seen it and we've never experienced it, and yet it happened because as the Word of God plainly tells us today, Jesus would find himself in kind of a difficult situation. It's near the end of his ministry, and he's, he's two miles out from Jerusalem in the region around Bethany. And in Jerusalem, you and I know that by this time, there were people out to get him, lots of them. Started with the Pharisees, teachers of the law, those in gathering around those Pharisees and influencers of the day, and feel, finally it became the Jewish people. They were looking for anything and everything to get rid of him. After a long day, they'd listen to his words and say, hey, is he being politically incorrect? Is he condescending towards someone? Is he breaking the laws of our land? Is he the one who claims to be something and isn't blasphemy, which in that day was, well, you get put to death for that. And finally, that's what they would put him to death for. Even though they couldn't find anything, they would search high and low. They would manufacture evidence. They would try to come up with witnesses to no avail. In fact, at one point, they would take Jesus to the brow of a cliff at the edge where they were wanting to just toss him off and get rid of him. Not my time yet, Jesus says as he walks through the crowd, across, away from his enemies, because he still had work to do. Enter Mary and Martha's words. Jesus takes his final steps to the tomb, and these words come to his ears. Lord, the one you love is sick. And so Jesus knows what he must do. John eleven three 3 says, When Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not going to result in death. It's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so what did Jesus do? He didn't tell them to go find the nearest physician. They probably already did that. He didn't tell them to go and check online for solutions. He didn't tell them to use the latest remedies. He didn't tell them to just trust in their ideas. He did something that makes absolutely no sense at all. He waited. He waited. Our, our text goes on to say this. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and yet when they heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the place where he was two more days and then he said to the disciples, all right, let's go back to Judea. That's not what you do when someone is sick. You get on the first plane, you hop in the car, you drop everything you're doing, and you're going. If they're within moments of dying, you get there. Why'd Jesus wait? So that the Son of God may be glorified. Why'd he wait two days? So Jesus could tell his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. Why did he wait two days? So the disciples could respond, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will get well. And so that Jesus could then patiently explain to the disciples, to you and me, to Mary and Martha, and to all gathered there, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. 
so that you may believe. And to his disciples he says, all right, now let's go to him. Nonsensical. After two days, all right, now we'll, take our, we'll make our way, and if you can just imagine in the disciples' minds, what in the world are we doing this for? Are we going there because there's like a funeral now? Why are we going? He's dead. What's the point? And on the way, of course, we remember that Martha does come and she meets him and, and she says, Lord, if, if, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus knew what she needed to hear. He said to her, your brother will rise again. And you and I know that when Martha heard that, she responded in spirit-filled faith. Yeah, I know that, Jesus. I, I know that you're, he's going to rise again in the resurrection and at the last judgment. And her faith-filled answer was fueled by what Jesus said, just as it is when you and I stand by the grave of our loved one who has fallen asleep in Jesus and the casket is lowered in and the pastor says, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, but doesn't stop there. He says, in the sure and certain hope to the resurrection, to eternal life. And so Jesus would say these words as he reminds us as well, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Do you believe this? He asks his disciples. Then, he asks his disciples, followers in faith, you and me, students of Jesus, do you believe this? And in faith we say, yes, Lord, we believe. Sometimes it's really difficult, but Thank you for giving me that faith that just simply clings to your word, your promises, and those final steps you took to this tomb today to reassure us that you are the resurrection and the life. But it wouldn't just be Martha. Mary would come out too and she would say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died in the midst of weeping and tears, not only of all those who were gathered there, but Mary and Martha, and then those, that, that famous smallest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. But not for long. Because as Jesus sees what death does, the result of sin, as Jesus sees how death just wreaks havoc in not only, not only fear, but also what comes after death to those who continually rely on the things of this life for happiness. He's deeply moved and does something different. He doesn't tell him, ah, just get over it. He doesn't say, go do some, go have some therapy. He doesn't say, go distract yourselves by being busy in your life. He says this, take away the stone. Go out to the gravesite, exhume the body, pull that body back up, and disturb everything around there. Why in the world would you do that? Martha says, by the way, of course she didn't say it that way, but you can imagine the thought going through the minds of those who were there. Roll the stone away? Martha says, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor. It's been four days. It doesn't take long for a body that hasn't been, how should I say, embalmed. They didn't do that in the Jewish, that was not their Jewish custom. They didn't do that. They would wrap the body up in strips, but they would not do any kind of embalming. And so, yeah, it's going to smell. It's going to be horrific. But that's why Jesus needed to say these words, too, as he stood before that tomb. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? This one gets me, and that's enough. That's enough. That's all Jesus needs to say. And so they took away the stone. Jesus looks up and he says, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And after this, he shouted with a 
loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And I love how the word of God defines this. The next words are, the man who had died came out with his feet and his hands bound with strips of linen and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him, take him off and let him go. Could you just even imagine what was going through the heart of Mary and Martha? They had laid him to rest. Four days had gone by, and now there he is standing in front of them. Do you think they would ever forget that? Do you think Lazarus would ever forget that? How about the apostles, those who Jesus had directly called to be those who would be the ones to carry that message and be the New Testament church? And how about his disciples? Not formally called by Jesus, but followers of him. Hey, kind of like you and me. Called through the word of God and and proved. Proved by a resurrection from death in this one tomb as Jesus took these final steps to it. As Jesus reminds us, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said those words, Lazarus, come out, because we needed to hear them too. We still need to hear them as we grieve our loved ones, as we we know that we too will not live forever. As we too know what Jesus has said through the Apostle Paul, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's our comfort when our loved ones fall asleep in Jesus. He's our comfort when we're close to falling asleep in Jesus, knowing that he will come and gently call us from slumber and resurrect us to life eternal. If he could do that with Lazarus, <laughs> oh, if he can do that with himself, and he makes that promise to you and me, then these final steps to the tomb are that important. And you think about it, when, When Jesus did this, it hadn't happened yet. His own death, waiting. You know, as we mentioned before, they were looking for opportunities. Anything that would happen, inappropriate, insensitive comments, any of the above. And Jesus gets the word and he waits. Let's go back to that for a minute. Why Why four days? It's a strange number. And why is it that that number just keeps popping out in this text? Four days he's been dead. Well, there is a, and again, this is false, okay? Don't walk home and ride home thinking that this is what the Bible says. This is what the Jewish Talmud was teaching. And the Talmud basically was a made-up oral tradition from the Pharisees and, the, and those who were in the, the the know, so to speak, in the temple. They would make up their own additions to the word of God. By the way, people still do that. Their tradition was that as a body dies, the soul and the body separated, the, and the soul just kind of kind of hovers around the grave. It's confused, and it doesn't know what to do for three days. But after the third day, there's no hope of any kind of resurrection. And so once that fourth day comes, the soul is gone. And so after four days, that's why Jesus comes back and he says, through John, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them They went to the Pharisees, and they tattled. 
they told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. By the way, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin didn't really get along, but they did when this guy was involved. So they called the meeting and they asked, what are we going to do? This man's going to, he's doing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. That was their concern. Everyone will believe in him. And then get this, and I'm not sure the logical conclusion here, but they said this, then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So somehow Jesus, having all kinds of followers, is going to have a political impact on how Rome's going to come and take away everything that they had. Well, there's one wise man in the midst. His name is Caiaphas, or Caiaphas. He says this. He's the high priest that year. You know nothing at all. You don't even consider that it's better for us that one man would die for the people than for the whole nation perish. He didn't say this on his own. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not only for that nation, but also in order to gather into one the scattered children of God. And so from that day on, they plotted to kill him. Sad irony, isn't it? Do you put these two together in your mind? The very one, the only one, who does a miracle bringing someone back, dead for four days to life, on its way to die for the whole world's sins, and the very people that needed him most seek to put him away. Put him out of sight, put him out of mind. I don't want to believe in him. I don't want to trust in him. I don't want to lose what I have here on this earth. I'd rather chase after Satan. As he licks his lips and he says, Ha, I've got you. But Jesus keeps walking. He keeps taking those final steps because he knows that you and me, as many times as we are afraid of death and as many times as we look at death and we say, I don't really want to die. I'm afraid. Rather than trusting in the one who is and has conquered death and given us the sure and certain promise of life, he proved it in Lazarus. And as we're going to see in a few weeks, he's going to go and he's going to suffer for even those sins of not trusting his promises and his word. And then he's going to die. He's not going to stay dead. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know how. We don't know where. But Jesus does. And for that, we don't need to be afraid. Because he's already already been through it. He's already taken us through it in his word. And he keeps leading us along. And he keeps teaching us. And he keeps bringing us. And he keeps comforting us. And he keeps bringing us on those final steps to where he shed his own blood. In his life. In his death. So that we can say, Amen, Amen, as Jesus said. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He's not going to come into judgment, but is crossed over from death to life. Amen, I tell you. A time is coming and is here now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who listen will live. Amen. Please rise. May that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated once again as we have the privilege to respond to the word of the Lord with our thank offerings. If you would also please make make use of this time to sign the friendship registers located at the ends of your pews and 
Make note of the people who are sitting around you, worshiping with you today. Please stand for prayer. Holy are you, O God, and righteous in all your works. You love righteousness and hate sin and have commanded a just punishment for all of that sin. You have declared that the wages of sin is death, and if you, O Lord, kept a record of wrongs, who of us could stand? There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands and no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and there is no one who does good, not even one. But with you there is forgiveness, and therefore you are feared. We come to you, Heavenly Father, and acknowledge our sins, for they are ever before us. We have the desire to do what's good, but we can't carry it out. When we want to do good, evil's right there with us. We failed to love you and our neighbor as we should. We've sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions, and we're unworthy to even be called your children. And yet we get to come to you in prayer, humbly trusting in your promises of forgiveness. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. According to your unfailing love, Lord, wash away our iniquities, cleanse us from our sins, remember no more the sins of our youth, but according to your love, remember us, for you are good. Turn us from error, save us from folly and Deliver us from the power of the devil. Lord, this week we remember Elaine Kolupka, who was hospitalized. Lord, be with her. Grant her healing according to your good grace and will. Restore her if that be your will, and reassure her of your grace and mercy. Finally, Lord, grant us strength and perseverance as we meditate on the passion of your Lord Jesus, your Son, our Savior, this season. Bestow on us the firm confidence that Christ has done all things for us and for our salvation. Comfort our hearts with this message of forgiveness. Bring us at last, then, into your heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray and join together as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you'd like to join along, we are going to continue in the hymnal from this point forth. 
from page 168 at the bottom. We'll continue with the words of institution. Page 168. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Page 170. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. You may be seated. We will close our service today with hymn 782, but because it is morning, we will sing the morning verse 1 instead of evening. We'll save that one for this Wednesday. But we'll sing verse um, 1, morning, and then verse 2 as well. It'll make sense once you get to it. <laughs> 